salvation, and the God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening and welcome to the Bryan Board of Public Affairs meeting for April 21st, 2015. And the first on our agenda is to approve the min minutes of the April 7th meeting. I see nothing wrong with them. I make a motion. Second. Al? Yes. Dick? Yes. Bonnie? Yes. Jim? Yes. Karen? Yes. Okay, number two, a uh, hearing of public concerns. Seeing none, we'll move on. Number three, clerk treasurer's report. The board's been presented with the clerk treasurer's report for the month ending March 31st, 2015. I'll make motion Second. Al? Yes. Karen? Yes. Bonnie? Yes. Jim? Yes. Dick? Yes. Number four, a resolution to authorize change order number one for the GT2 rotor inspection and repair. Okay, this will be resolution number 17, 2015. Uh, resolution authorizing the director of utilities to accept change order number one for the GT number two rotor inspection and repair with Salzer Turbo Services Houston Inc. for an increase in contract of $613,800 for a total contract cost of one million five hundred and twenty five thousand twenty five dollars so let's give a little quick history on this again we discussed this um, at the April 7 meeting uh, sort of brought to you as just for discussion purposes only looking for at that time open discussion opinions options you know, we those options out and if you recall we had option one which was to replace uh, the bad blades and at that time they analyzed 122 of the blades to be replaced um, very minor work in the sense of uh, there are still some things that are not all the way up to engineering specs but they are within tolerances but we're not going to give you a warranty so here's where we're at at a cost of uh, 1.325 million um, there's some other chains behind that but about 1.325 million option two was to replace all 915 blades on it on the rotor itself um, refurbish row 5 disc and install a new Icono 715 marriage bolts for the uh, original. So the original plus this change order for that would be 1.525, which is what's in front of you. And again, when we talk about those uh, those uh, Icono marriage bolts, those are the long bolts that put the whole thing together, runs right through it. Okay, so very expensive piece of equipment that those bolts are. And then option three, which um, was look at purchasing a used rotor from Salzer. Um, and with that, we discussed that the rotor that they had had been on the shelf for 10 years. It had some damage from being on the shelf for 10 years. They would still have to break it down, go through it. It had about 75% uh, of available life expectancy still in it, not much more. And uh, they would still provide a warranty, but you were buying a sort of as-is type, here you go. Okay, and that was at $1.336 million. So after much discussion and you know, Matt and I gave our recommendation to the board at that time what we felt would be the best option, which was option two. There seemed to be a board consensus with that recommendation, um, and that's why we're bringing this resolution 17 to you to continue on with the work. So this is an official change order per um, what's in the bid document, the bid book. So um, I'm open for more discussion on it. Uh, it is quite a bit of money. Um, again, realize that particular unit has... Uh, I'm going to call it averted savings, or it's saved the, our customers since 2009 about $5.9 million. And again, I wish I could back into the date of installation on out and tell you the full savings that that unit has helped us realize. Um, I, would, I would go out on a limb and say this type of repair brings it to the, the highest quality coming back to us. Um, we should. You know, knock on wood, we should get 20, 30 more years out of it. Mm -hmm. And within, if you're looking at like a return on investment, we should be able to see that money come back home fairly quick. Oh, yeah. You know, within, mm -hmm. I'm going to say, probably two and a half, three years. And the three years that I'm throwing out is just transmission savings. Mm -hmm. You know, because that unit's about $500,000 on transmission savings. So mm -hmm. that doesn't encompass capacity or demand response or peak shaving. I mean, 
there's a lot more going on there to help mm -hmm. our revenue stream come from it. So the figure you're giving is very conservative. Very conservative, yeah. 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 And again, you're only looking at, you know, two hundred thousand dollars difference mm -hmm. for what you're getting in the long run makes sense to do it the way we're doing. Mm -hmm. In census of a capital improvement, not a repair, which you would amortize over thirty years isn't too much money. No. But since we're on a cash basis, it's a big expenditure. I'm gonna and now the accountants will change that when they do the audit. Am I correct, Laura? Yeah, they will review They put it on a cruel basis. Mm -hmm. So it isn't as big as you think. So that would be um, my team's recommendation. That's why Resolution 17 brought, is brought out this way. Um, we would recommend that you would um, pass this. Any further, rec any further uh, discussion? I make the motion. I'll second. Al? Yes. Dick? Yes. Bonnie? Yes. Jim? Yes. Karen? Yes. Mr. Killing, you have permission to call them up and say, let's get rolling on this. I'll keep them going. Tell them we need it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number five, a request to hire seasonal part-time laborers for the water, power plant, auglays, and engineering departments. Okay, I'm going to hand you a stack of one, two, three, four, I believe there's four here, of, of uh, seasonal part-time help. Um, as you're going through those, to look at them, one will be Hayden Hageman, uh, he'll be seasonal help for the engineering department. Uh, Thomas Iyer, seasonal help for engineering department. Kyle Roop, seasonal help for auglaze and the power plant. And Nathaniel Ryle, which will be seasonal help for water distribution and treatment. Um, I did want to point out that we typically don't hire a lot of summer mm -hmm. staff members for the engineering department, but these two individuals have um, some database experience and very, very strong computer skills. We have on the books to undertake uh, two large GIS projects this summer uh, where these individuals will be going out and data logging um, global position of our current meter bases within the city, as in every home as well as manufacturer make all the, all the relevant information on the meter itself. Um, it will help us as a utility. It will help Lori on the downtown staff. So that is why we are, we're taking two in that department. In addition to that, we will be able to use those, one of those two members on a slower day in other assets or areas in our office. But uh, most of these uh, come with very high recommendations. Um, we did check the references. I, I, I would recommend that we bring them on as our seasonal help for this year. Can I a motion? I'll make a motion. We hire. Second. Jim? Yes. Karen? Yes. Bonnie? Yes. Al? Yes. Dick? Yes. is a presentation by Electric Superintendent Al Sullivan on meter base upgrades. Um, this presentation that I have here, it's, it's brief. Um, it's really just a note of finding everyone's support here to, uh, to start a proactive meter base replacement project that, that um, affects a number of homeowners within the, in the Bryan. Currently, you know, the way we address uh, meter base issues and meter service issues in our department is if the customer has a, a, a panel that they're upgrading in, inside 
and they require the, the power to be shut off. That's when we require them to upgrade the outside of their of their service. Um, or or if, if something happens that we need to go to the home and pull the meter and the meter base falls apart or something like that, and that requires immediate attention, you know, that's how we get our upgrades done now. This is taking more of a proactive approach and identifying the ones, the 60 amp and 100 amp meter bases that we have in town to, uh, to kind of um, go ahead and, and address it with the homeowners now and, and get something going to get them replaced. Um, this is just, a, I thought it was a pretty good slide that, that shows the, the, you know, the utilities responsibility and what the utility owns versus what the customer owns. Um, if you can see in red, everything in red is what the utility is responsible for. Um, if you notice, um, you know, the service line coming off the pole to the mast is our responsibility. The customer, the mast, the connection above, uh, the meter base, um, the underground conduit out to the pole or transformer, pedestal, whatever it might be, is all on the, uh, the customer. Uh, we are responsible for the wire inside that conduit. We are responsible for the meter and the meter base. Um, a lot of people don't really realize that that mast and, and that service is, is the homeowners, but if we plug our meter into it and provide power to that home, we have to make sure that that is in good working condition. And if it isn't, you know, it's our responsibility to, to make them aware of it and, and require the upgrade. Um, is that the standard arrangement in the, yes, in the, in the industry? A, yeah, yes, this okay. is a typical situation that we have in the industry. Okay. And that's what we, what, how we address and, and how we, we do things here in Bryan also. Any questions on that? That you, you know, that picture there. Please stop me anytime and ask any questions. You know, wish you would. Uh, if you ask me, you know, what what gives us the right to to dictate what's you know how to address people and and, and what uh, what I want to say code or whatever we follow. We have a section in the zoning code at section 117507, which addresses electrical system hazards. And it pretty much gives me the ability to, to uh, correct and eliminate hazards that I, that I see. Um, this was put in, I know when Brian was, was the superintendent and we were working with the fire department and, and Andy up to the zoning um, on, on this issue. Um, there's also language in our, in our rules and regs um, section 22 that uh, gives us the ability to, to address issues like this with the meter bases and anything that we feel is hazardous to take it out of service and get it corrected. So um, I have made contact with, with both the uh, fire chief and the zoning administrator of what, what I'm proposing here tonight and they, they both I feel have, I have their support when it comes to this. So. That's, uh, I guess that. Um, just an example of a typical uh, deteriorated electric service or, or, or stuff that we, we see out there in the field, just to kind of maybe give you guys a little light on it. Um, I'll, I'll start off by saying there, there's really only about 7% of the meter bases, plus or minus, in, the, in, the, uh, in town here, that, which is about 300 of them that are in this type of condition. With the uh, this is you know this includes the 60 and 100 amp meter bases with the deteriorated SEU cable. When I mean SEU cable, I mean the cable from the meter base to the mast is is shown. It's worn. It's uh, the uh, conductors are are the, the, you know the coating that was on that cable when it was installed is gone from the weather. You know the the UV uh, rays. You know the wind works on it. Um, anything like that is what we, you know, we look at and we feel it's deteriorated enough that we need it replaced. Now, would it be safe to say that meter set has probably been in service and was installed 40 plus years ago? Yes. Yeah. 40 plus years. Um, 
you know, one of the one of the issues we have is when we go to a home like this, or, or and we have to pull them <coughs> here for a reason, you know, whatever reason it might be. It might be a, you know, a, you know, a, a non-pay or a, a storm damage or something like that. That we have to pull that meter. We pull that meter, and then them guts or mechanical workings inside that meter base come out, and there we are. Uh, we have a meter base that we don't own that's come apart. How do we provide this person with service if we have a situation like that? This will address that up front to get these taken care of so we don't fall, you know, have that situation where we have to uh, get, you know, work where the customer will have to get an electrician in and get it rectified, you know, within a short amount of time, which, you know, costs them more money. And, uh, you know, we don't want to put anything, we don't want to power a service up that we feel that, that could be detrimental to the home or, or even, you know, the, the people inside the home. So that's uh, kind of one of the reasons there. Um, as you can see also on some of these services, it's hard to see, but right here you can see the house knob is actually pulled out of the house from, from the line coming in. That's another typical thing that we find out there in the, in the, uh, in the uh, field. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, there's the SCR cable uh, that has deteriorated. This is on the bottom side of the ear base, typically. Um, this is from the meter base into the panel. It's usually SCR. SCR cable has a, uh, an actual conductor for the neutral that's in the sleeve, and it's not a bunch of... SCU has strands of copper that they bring together as the neutral from the, from the top. SCR cable has an actual conductor inside, two hot legs and a conductor. That's different. Um, if we find that to be in, in poor condition, you know, that would require an upgrade. Uh, the house house requirement, you know, the house attachment doesn't meet our height requirements. This one wouldn't meet our height requirement. And uh, materials such as gutters, I know, is, is a problem where, where they've wrapped a gutter and the, and the gutter is rubbing against the, the, the cable, which, you know, over time that can, that can rub into that and electrify the gutter. You know, that's a potential hazard that, that I see. Um, these are examples of overhead, our overhead standard that we, you know, a typical, like on the side of a house, what we, re, we would require. And we're talking about the weatherhead. When I say weatherhead, I mean the, the top of the mast right here. That needs to be at 13 feet from the surface level. When I mean surface level, that can be, you know, the ground level. It could be the top of a deck. It could be steps, whatever that somebody can stand and, and touch that, that has to be 13 feet. Um, the attachment uh, height needs to be 12.6, and when I say attachment height, the service coming in from the pole, that point right there where it attaches, and when, when we have our drip loop where we make our connections into the weather, that has to be at 12.6. Uh, and uh, five foot six is from the surface level to the meter, the meter location. That's, uh, you know, just for a number of different reasons, to read the meter for one and to uh, you know pull the meter safely. So we have to have that at five foot six. Um, schedule 40 and Schedule 80 PVC pipes are, are acceptable for this type of installation. Uh, we also have another standard, which is an overhead standard, which is where you're going to pierce a roof line. Um, you know, the mast must extend 18 inches above the roof. The conduit mast, over 36 inches, shall have a guy wire support. And this is all done by the customer. This is all their responsibility to do this. Um, no coupling shell will be installed above the roof line, and all conduit shall be steel rigid um, from, the, from the top of the meter base through the roof to the service mast. You know, these yep. are requirements in the codes that we have here in Bryan. Right. These are not arbitrarily just we threw numbers out. These right. are codes that fall under the National Electric Safety Code, the NESC. Right. And that's where we have designed our, our, our specs from. Our, our specs, right. These are all our specs. So. And, um, 
brands that, that you know everybody follows these when they put in a new service. Uh, this is uh, I, I've included just an example of a, an underground exist an underground service entrance that would be new. You know, with, um, the conduit should be three inch PVC and it should have a berry depth of two foot six inches. Um, conduit expansion couplings are required now on our on our meter base, and that's in this location right here. This is for the you know the freezing and thawing of the ground, which moves the conduit. It can move it quite a bit, which a lot of times, um, you know, if, if you didn't have that expansion coupling, you could pull that conduit right out of the bottom of the meter base. So we included that in the spec to alleviate that problem with the heat and, and stuff with the uh, conduit. So that's part of our spec. We incorporated two ground rods to be driven six uh, feet apart and not exceed three inches above the, the surface level. And uh, all conduits um, shall be installed from the meter base to the source by the customer, which is, you know, as going back to that second slide I had, you know, it's the customer's responsibility to put the conduit in from the, the meter base to the pole to the transformer to the pedestal, whatever we have there, is what we call the point of service. Um, well, I have a question. Okay. What's the object of the two ground rods? Two ground rods, in case you <coughs> lose one, you have another one to back it up. You, oh, have, okay. you don't lose your ground. So I'm, that's I'm just thinking know. most people only have one ground rod out there. Right, right. We went with two in case something would happen that you would lose that. You would always have that other one to back it up. Oh, okay. we have a separate ground. I did not know that. I was a consumer. I would be concerned that um, a contractor might come in and not do it to code, and then I'm stuck having to, you know, what what is a good way for the consumer to protect themselves? Do we do they wait until wait to pay the contractor until you guys have come out and inspected it, or um, we won't hook the service up until it's done to the specification that we okay. need. I mean, we'll, we come out and our service man is very good with knowing what heights that we require and and the, and the ground rods that are what he looks at. Um, you know, if something doesn't look right, we won't hook it up, and they usually give Adam or I a call to come out and, and address it with the contractor. Okay. A little history on our code and whatnot. <coughs> About 2007, we really undertook that time um, redoing our what we would consider our code to match the NASC, as well as put together our spec sheets that reflect that. At the same time, we dove into the rules and regs and implemented the aid to construction clause that's in there that talks about how much we would charge per foot for wire, and it's the contractor's responsibility to put conduit pathways in, um, even for large-scale developments. Um, so at that time, that was rather rough because at the city of Bryan, the typical utility paid for everything, turnkey. So that was a change. Um, part of all this process, we also built into that the ability to inspect on the outside because at that time the National Electric Safety Code allowed utilities to govern and inspect from the meter set to the pole. That's where we were governed by, not the National Electric Code which is inside. Since then there's been some crossover with both entities and they have, if you go to the National Electric Code book and the NESC book, they have a, usually a, a, a circle around the meter base and they sort of mesh over top. But inspection-wise, on the outside would definitely be us. We would never go inside and inspect inside because we don't have that authority. Right. When you get a, a electrician to do inside work, um, they they need to do that work within the NEC, which mm -hmm. is the National Electric Safety Code. And if they're any type of electrician, they know they they will be doing that to that code. You know that stuff. Um, that's why I put on here, uh, all, sir, all new service upgrades must meet current BMU specifications and rules and regulations and meet the National Electric Code. Um, applications for, for service can be obtained through our office here, 841 East Edgerton Street, Bryan, Ohio. Um, the fees I'm about to, to talk about are, are fees for us. These are for, through the utility which we will, will require a wiring permit of $20 each. When I say each, that's for each meter. If it's a, if 
it's a two game meter, you know, it'd be forty dollars. Three game, sixty dollars. So that's uh, per meter uh, as far as the wiring permit goes. You will need three wiring permits for a three game, or, or two wiring permits for a two game, etc. Um, our typical overhead underground 200 amp meter base with a built and disconnects $175 each. And that can be, and that's to be purchased through our our utility office here, and we stock that item for, for people. Um, please keep in mind if 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 we go go through with this that you know any uh, you know I, I, I'm, I'm, let me start by saying well, I'm proposing sending letters to all the residents that have the prop you know service problems. Um, I'm I'm, I'm kind of proposing a year time frame to, to have the upgrades completed to give them enough time to to get the upgrades and. And another thing, you know, 300, you know, we actually have about 240 working days in a year. You know, if you figure 300, that's more than one a day. You know, if you think of that, that's that's workload on us. Um, Al? Yeah. So we're talking about, we're going to do inspections on everybody in town that doesn't have the 200 amp meter base, the proper conductor size. Um, any oh, not, not up to code, I guess is what I should say. Right. We're right. going to do random inspections to find these people. What we've done is um, my initial. Like, who who goes to the meter base every every uh, month is our meter readers. Right. So I put a little code in their in their meter reader handheld that they could mark if they went up to a meter base and mm -hmm. saw that it had deteriorated SEU or it was a 60 amp meter base and they marked it. So I developed this list of 300 spots in town, meters. Um, and at this point in time right now as we, as we speak, I have the line crew going out and taking that list and we're going out to each meter and we're taking a picture of it. That way I can verify that what the meter reader has done, it's kind of checks and balances, make sure that what they've given me is right and, and, and it needs, needs done. So that's how I develop my list of people. Um, I'd like to send that them people a letter, giving them a year to have their service upgraded. Um, you know, up to our current standard uh, service. You know, and uh, you know, keep in mind though, you know, if we do have problems with pulling meters and and, and problems or with their meter bases or something like that, we still want to require that meter to be. Replace before we can power back up. But you know, we've always we've always had the authority. I mean, when something, if something burns itself clear, if something goes wrong, the meter base burns up, connectors burn up, whatever. I mean, and, and I remember from my time uh, that, and, and most sensible people, if you tell most sensible people, most people don't know the condition of their service. They don't know if they've got a 200 amp meter base or a 60 amp meter base. They don't know if they've got a number two copper, or number two aluminum. They just don't know until something goes wrong and then but when something does go wrong and I mean most sensible people you can talk to and and make them realize that that it needs attention I, mean, I don't know well so initially where, when Al brought this to me mm -hmm. um, you know our current package is a 200 amp meter set outside and if the consumer inside has a 100 amp or 200 amp mm -hmm. panel and the sub breaker assembly has to be matched that panel. Right. There are quite a few hundred amp meter sets that are that are not in in such a, a sh bad shape that it would need to be changed. So we, we we realize that, but we do have a lot of 60 amp meter sets and some hundred amps that are in bad shape. So oh, we're tackling first. Oh, I can I can test to that. If you go around and pick all the 60 and, and even the hundred amp meter bases in town. Uh, also, don't the, like the you talked about the two and the three gang meter bases, like on on triplexes, duplexes, and triplexes. Aren't those rated at 100 amp? Yeah, individually. Right. Yeah. What so, do you do about those? But if they have deteriorated SEU cable feeding them, they're upgraded. That they need to upgrade. And when they upgrade, we're gonna they're gonna upgrade to a 200 amp with a disconnect. And then if they want to put a 100 amp service or a 100 amp uh, disconnect below that 200 amp mm -hmm. disconnect. It meets code. It protects the wire. It is what it is. You know, everything in town's got to disconnect eventually. Mm -hmm. It's a safety thing. Sure. 
And you were right. We have always had the ability to just go ahead and do this. Yeah. And when Al brought this to me, we were talking about it, and he's like, you know, even when you were superintendent, you struggled with this, and you know there's some projects coming where we need these cleaned up soon. And uh, my comment at that time was, you know what? I know the backlash I received as the superintendent when we did the, the changes to the conduit and the aid to construction and some of these things we've done. Um, even we had some serious backlash when we implemented our, our regulations on what we want to see a meter set look like based on code. That, that was a rough six month period. This will be too because you're asking people to spend dollars. So when that side was, let's bring it to the board, let's get the board's input. It's something that has to be done. But the community needs to know that the board's aware of it. It's just not the big bad utility saying, "Here's a no, number." No, I, well, in that, I guess maybe that's what's in the back of my mind. And I would say that your, th your, the number three hundred that you came up with, that's probably a pretty conservative number. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of hundred amp meter bases out there, and there's quite a few sixty amp meter bases still. I don't. I, I, the problem I see is maybe convincing people like this. <laughs> that well, there's. Don't get me wrong. I know there's a lot of them out there in bad shape, mm -hmm. and the, and they need addressed. Some of them, some of the other ones, I'm not so sure. And I'm not sure you're, I'm not sure it'll be easy to convince these people. Well, I haven't had any trouble with it. Why do I have to change it? I realize the letter. They don't even know they own that. Right. Base. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's why the sixty-five you know days. Yeah. That's why we the initial letter calls out that within the next calendar year, we need you to do X, Y, and Z. And the safety side of it is, if we deem it unsafe. We have the authority with the PNZ, the, those regulations, as well as the fire chief, that there's a potential fire there, we'll turn the power off. We, we don't need a house fire. We don't need a fatality because of a bad meter base. And it's happened. And we've had fires because of meter bases that sure. were bad. You know, we and should be able to consumers got to understand it's for their own safety. Yes. I mean, how many people? Well, I'm, I'm not arguing the safety aspect. You know, I, I'm all for safety. But I, my, my point is it's going to be hard to convince some of these people that that they really need to spend this kind of money for this upgrade if they haven't had problems. Like I say, I'm sure there's plenty of them out there that do. Um, similar, the, a community very close to us had done, has done a similar project like this when they cleaned up their town with, you know, with, minimal, with minimal problems. So, um, How, and that and I'll help you out here because I, I worked with that other town when they were doing this and we've discussed it many times since then, me and their superintendent. The success of their program um, was directly tied to their council and board standing behind, this is what we're going to do, we have to do it, um, and there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's sort of what we're coming to you guys, you know, as Al asked if you talk, I said sure, because the buy-in needs to start here, so when the phone calls come, they're going to come to me and Al, but when they don't, when the person or persons are not happy with our answers, you're the next line they're going to call. And it's something that we have to believe in, that it's a safety thing we're doing to clean the system up. I mean, you have stuff out there that's 50 years old. Oh, yeah. You know, it needs to be cleaned up. And a lot of those, a lot of your customers, I mean, I pay attention to everything around my house, but I'll be honest with you, I've never stood there. Of course, I put a new. We'll send you that letter shortly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know we put a new 200 amp in there, so I, I know that's right. But I, I mean, no, most people don't stand there and inspect their wiring and their service entrance cable, and you know what I mean. Right. I wouldn't even know it. <laughs> right. So we all get it. Well, again, it's safety. It's safety. I mean, well, why would you take a chance of letting your house catch on fire? Maybe these then you got to fix it. Right. Maybe these letters that we send out, maybe <clears throat> that'll maybe give the opportunity to maybe take a look at it, right? You know, and, and, and see what we see. You know, I know it's something that you know that we we deal with daily, right? You know, like meter bases and, and everything. So you know, I mean, I don't I don't mean to bring this to you and, and you know make hardship for somebody. You know, I, that's my last thing I want to write. Main, one of the main things for me is when I send like our service guy out there and he has to pull a meter, I want to make sure he's going to be safe too. Sure. These meters are known to, you know, they're known to flash I mean, when you're pulling them. That's why we put our people in FR clothing and, and give them all the safety, you know, stuff when they're pulling meters and they have that. So, you know, it's, it's you know, that's the last thing I want to see is somebody get hurt pulling a meter like this. Mm -hmm. so, 
Al? Yeah. Uh, who can uh, replace the meter base? Do they have to be a certified electrician? Uh, can it be a guy who went through some technical course on this? Or? Well, um, now we leave it up to the homeowner to, to hire an electrician to do the work. Um, I don't know if we, we, we don't require any state certification in the city of Bryan um, to do that. Uh, I would surely think that a homeowner would hire somebody that's competent enough to, to know, you know how to, re, how to do, do the work. You know, or has done it before in the past, you know. Um, you know so we haven't that. actually contacted any electricians in town to say, hey, you may be called and can you work with these people or? No, but that could be a step from this point on that we could do, you know. And I'll, I'm going to throw this out okay. because of the electrician side in town. Because we are the utility and we represent every customer, we are very careful in recommending electricians or calling electricians. We typically ask all the electricians in town, give us your cards. And when a customer needs assistance, I'll hand you every one of those cards. Feel free to call any one of them because we really don't want to get into the, the game of electrician A going, you gave five jobs to B and that's not fair. You're showing that's favoritism. That's not what I asked though. I, not that we would say they have to use an electrician. It's just what the opposite. Uh, Right, but where you're going is we call the electrician up and say, we're going to be implementing this policy. Can you work with these people? I don't know if we can do that. But as I was going to say, is that the case? Somebody can't do their own wiring as long as they put in the two ground rods, use a proper size conductor and, and the right meter base. Yeah, they as long as it do it themselves. And on the other end of it, it's going to be inspected before you. You're going to get the okay before you can plug in. Right. So it's going to be done right. Right. I was just referring, giving them heads up that they may be getting a call and and because they'll they're going to be calling these people and they're going to say the utility is making me do this. Right. I'm just letting them know if they right. would. That's a good point. For the reason being that they're old and they need good point, Karen. upgraded. Yeah. It, uh, that's all I was wondering and, about and, communication. You know, maybe we develop a list of some sort, like Brian said, that we could hand out. You know that these are local electricians that can, or, can do the work or not even you know it's just to right. let them know they need to have some ground rods in stock or some wire or right. what have you yeah. something like yeah, that there's there's people in town that do their own upgrades mm -hmm. you know that didn't do a real good job of it you know um, yeah. that's why i wanted to Right. bring up that question because um, some people are going to say, well, who do I call? Right. And you can have the guy down the street if he's done it before, or you can hire him. Right. And, and we want to always have a, an open door policy with our with our customers and our and our owners that, you know, they can call us here in the electric department anytime and, you know, work through any issue that we have problem-wise with, you know, trying to get the you know, the work done and point them in the right direction as far as where to fill out the permits and stuff like that. If there's any questions about it, you know, they can call us. So, is there any other questions? Nope. Thanks, John. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Al. Thanks, Al. Seven, a request to reschedule the May 19th board meeting. Okay, um, the May 19th, which is the second board meeting in May, I'll be out of town from the 15th to the 20th at the uh, APPA meeting, as well as I know the OMEA legislative and mayor's reception uh, down at Columbus at the Rune Rife Center uh, is that particular day as well. Um, I'm asking or proposing that we change the May 19th meeting to May 26th, which is the following week at 5 p.m. Um, if you could check your schedules, I mean, we really need to get moving on that as much as possible. I know I talked to um, Dick tonight earlier. Yeah, as, that will help me out because I was going to miss the 19th <laughs> meeting, so. And, and also the OMEA legislative meetings as well as that reception down there is, if, if any board member wants to go, contact Sylvia, I think we included. Um, yes. And, and Mary, are you going down and getting yes. sure you're always down there for that? So you'll, you'll have somebody who can sort of guide you through the the political waters on who to talk to and who's who. Hopefully if everybody shows, shows up. up. <laughs> yeah, if the right people show up. But I, I would recommend if you haven't been down there, take the time, get registered, go down. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a good place to network um, on that level. And the, there's some really good people there. So it's... 
I know Karen's checking her schedule. Is the 26 going to be okay for pretty mm -hmm. much everyone? Works for me. Mr. Salisbury, you good with that? As far as I know now, yeah. Would we need a motion then to yes. move from the 19th to this one, 26? So Second. Did? Yes. Karen? Yes. Body? Yes. Jim? Yes. Al? Yes. And number eight, affect semi monthly disbursements. Well, a few then announced, but I, I will pay the bills. Second. Karen? Yes. Dick? Yes. Bonnie? Yes. Jim? Yes. Al? Yes. Comments from BPA and staff, number nine. Um, a couple things. We sold um, 75 solar racks to Australian Energy Corp for $35 per rack. Um, we did some through Merrimax Spectrum, which we've used before. In addition, we sold uh, 1,400 non-solar racks, which are your hydro racks, at $4 each which meets the, what the board had laid out uh, two years ago. We're probably going to have to revisit that resolution and bring back, um, to be quite honest, the rec market is tanking. Um, I, I get the PUCO registry every day uh, and sort of breeze through it. Um, there are more and more solar recs coming into the, into the market, and, and it's really diluting the market. The other side of that coin is, the purchasers of the solar recs uh, used to be a lot of the IOUs. Um, today, a lot of the IOUs have their own solar facilities and are some of the sellers in the market. So it's really forced that price down. I mean, we're seeing $35, and it was uh, it was a chore to get to $35. Um, the, the, real at the real prices were coming around $33, $34, right. and, and my comment was, well, I have a board that only approved this, and if you want them, this is where we're at. They're going to continue to go down. Um, the hydro wrecks, I think you're going to see the same thing. There are several big hydro projects in Ohio that have been registered. Um, there will be probably three million plus hydro wrecks coming into the market real soon. So you'll see that three dollar price probably drop to a dollar. Now, when you're that three million wreck guy dumping those on the market, that's a three million dollar revenue stream every year. But for our smaller guys who are seven thousand wrecks, you know. It, it, it takes us from $30,000 to $7,000 real quick. So we did sell those. Um, probably I have I've got some other contracts we're working through. We're going to finish off selling the 2015 SREX, which are your solar, uh, that are not under contract. And I went ahead and pushed through at the same price, the 2016, they call it a forward contract, based on what we're going to produce, just because I needed to capitalize on the $30, $35 before the bottom dropped out anymore. Um, the other thing, the uh, uh, Fremont Energy Campus, that uh, peaking replacement power that you purchased or allowed AMP to purchase on our behalf, uh, the first block, which was your January 1, 2015 to December 31, 2016, was secured at $40.75. I realize that's peak on peak, so that's a great price. And the next block or block two from J1 2017 to the end of that calendar year, which was the need we had, came in at 41.75. Um, forward projections in the, uh, on base load and, and gas all show to be coming in low. But I, I, I don't know if I'd hang my head on that yet. You know, we're talking three, four years out. If you're reading the Blade and the Wall Street and everywhere else, uh, Ohio is seeing l large numbers of coal generation being shut down. Uh, a lot of gas generation coming online. Uh, eventually, you're going to see that that uh, capacity of the gas lines themselves be exceeded, so which will force the price up. Um, I don't know where we're going to be at in the future, but uh, I don't think you're going to continue to see these $43 prices. You know five, six years out. I just don't see that. In fact, I was at a meeting last Friday that discussed some of this, and it's a very volatile, volatile forward trend. I mean, the, the, the crossover between gas and power is, is happening a couple of years out, and it doesn't make sense that it's where it's happening at. So, Other than that, I think that's it on my comments. Mayor? Not too much tonight, except I was reminded by the chamber that uh, this weekend is a fireworks auction for, uh, that's how we get the 
funds to uh, do our fireworks, and uh, this is a weekend for that. Uh, I think it's going to be held at the Eagles. I can't think there's still tickets available. And uh, they're also looking in, uh, if you look at our water tower uptown, 1840, and this is 2015, it's the 175th year for the city. So, uh, you know, as parades are coming up and things like that, we might want to look to, to highlight that 175 years for us. So we're going to start working with the chamber and, and maybe get some things going on that. So that's about it right now. Yeah. Rhonda? Laura? No, ma'am. Anyone else? I went to the Northwest Electric meeting this last Saturday, and, and what you were talking about, the primary thing, the speaker was talking about coal, because they're basically all on coal, and he was talking about that their members should get out and fight this issue to make it so that the cost of them go up. That was the main thing. I, uh, they had all the talks, but that was the main thing. And, uh, then they announced who these students was that one, and one was a Bauer girl. Uh, that's the wife's daughter, and uh, from Brian. So, but the coal issue was the discussion. That's all. And the coal issue could change in 2016. <laughs> <laughs> Whether that life's good. <laughs> okay. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Dick? Yes. Karen? Yes. Bonnie? Yes. Jim? Yes. Al? Yes.